Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Boris Abrams and we are continuing our readings of I Am That by Nisargadatta Maharaj, who was a sage in India and people would come and visit him in his, uh, I want to say ashram, um, but I'm not sure, but they would come and visit him, had all these questions about how to live a more spiritually evolved, fulfilled life. And Maharaj would basically come back with these often very cryptic yet simultaneously very blunt responses that when you hear them, when you read them, you think, yeah, there's truth in that. But you also think, what the fuck are you talking about? Okay, so that's what we're reading right now. Um, we're going to be reading a very, very brief chapter called Witnessing, uh, which is chapter 10, if you're following along in the book. Now, I do just want to take a brief moment to explore the concept of desire. Hmm. Now, a lot of the time in spiritual teachings, when we come across the concept of desire, it is always painted in a negative way. But not even in a negative way, like desiring is wrong, in the sense like it's sinful, but it's painted as the root cause of suffering, which on some level it is. Desire, at its core, is an energy. Take away the thought of the desire, take away what you're actually desiring right now and feel that energy within you. This, it, desire is the same as fear, the same as joy, the same as anxiety, the same as love. It's energy, different, different flavors of energy moving through the body. What happens is when the energy field of desire arises within the body, it then hijacks the mind and says to the mind, something is missing. The mind then searches what could possibly be missing, latches onto a concept of something that is missing. My girlfriend, for example, my boyfriend, my car, my money, something, whatever. So it latches onto it. And then it tells you, like in the feedback loop, you won't be happy until you have that in your life right now. That is what desire is on a core fundamental level. And it is icky and it is resisting what you are currently experiencing. Okay, you are currently experiencing moment A and you are desiring to be elsewhere in moment B. You will never be in moment B because you're always in moment A from that place of desire. If and when you attain your desire, things align briefly and you're happy. But then before you know it, energy field of desire arises in the body, crosses over into the mind or the ego. Hey, you're missing something. You're not going to be happy until this something is fulfilled. Mind goes searching. What could be missing now? Ah, the job. The job isn't good anymore. Lack of vacation. So then it latches onto that desire. And suddenly, when we have a desire, it becomes an all-consuming drive that is never pleasant, that is never fulfilling, that is completely blinding to the current moment. Let's take a very simple idea that we can all relate to. Thirst, the desire to drink. I'm thirsty right now. I can go without having my water right now, but the longer I withhold from drinking, the more the thirst is going to build, the more my mind is going to be aware of its lack, the more I'm going to be only focused on fulfilling that need to drink water. But my mind is going to be in such a frenzy, I'm not necessarily going to be going to the faucet to drink water. I mean, this is just an analogy, get over it. But like, you know what I mean? It, it, it just becomes this all-consuming need, a compulsion to get that. And the longer I'm in that state of needing that water, I'm just completely oblivious to everything. And that is suffering. I do not think for one minute that spiritual teachers and if you know, you do get some who really just say, go and live in a, you know, a forest in isolation. Nah, not, not, I don't agree with that. But you, I do think a lot of the spiritual teachers who advocate um, dropping desire, such as Nisargadatta Maharaj, 
they don't say renounce worldly things. They don't say, you know, avoid pleasure. They do say that when you get in this cycle of want, need, desire, attachment, fulfillment briefly, and then, you know, that egoic cycle, then yeah, of course, you're going to be completely blinded to the reality and you are going to be in that perpetual cycle that we just described of needing something, finding it, needing something again, which is never at peace. But the actual enjoyment of something tangible is great. I actually think, just as a side note, uh, something that I'm coming to realize in my studies is that desires are a gift from, well, not even a gift, desires are a universal impulse to fulfill something, to progress on the journey. For example, if you have a desire to switch career, I think that desire is sort of like a sign, a, a alert from source, whatever you want to call it, God saying, this is now the next chapter of your life for whatever evolutionary purposes. And you, you basically say, okay, I accept that desire by fulfilling it within first, say, okay, great, this is coming now. And then you, you move along that trajectory to bringing it into your reality. The energy field is completely different. It is no longer from that clutching, needing, lack, which only gets more and more and more and more intense. David R. Hawkins, who is one of my primary spiritual teachers, developed the map of consciousness, which we will explore in another series of videos, but he identifies the field of desire, the level of consciousness of desire as actually being harmful to life. When you can rise to levels of consciousness that are, are enjoyable and blissful and are in harmony with the now moment, not resisting the now, you will actually find the fulfillment of desires like that. Eckhart Tolle has a story where he would, you know, and this is common, he would be sitting, I think he's saying he's sitting in Hampstead Heath and, you know, he would desire water and then suddenly somebody would come and offer him water or food. Uh, you know, like things like that, when you get in line with the universe, you do become one with the universe and your desires are just things telling you to go different directions, okay? So I just want to explore that first. Now, let's see what happens in this chapter called Witnessing. The questioner comes to Maharaj. I am full of desires and want them fulfilled. How am I to get what I want? Even if you look at the language the questioner sort of uses here, how am I to get what I want? It's very egoic. It's, you can see he's in the grip of the mind telling this questioner that he won't be happy until he fulfills his desires. Maharaj says, do you deserve what you desire? In some way or other, you have to work for the fulfillment of your desires. Put in energy and wait for the results. The questioner says, where am I to get the energy? Maharaj says, the desire itself is energy. The questioner, then why does not every desire get fulfilled? Maybe it was not strong enough and lasting. Yes, that is my problem. I want things, but I'm lazy when it comes to action. When your desire is neither clear nor strong, it cannot take shape. Besides, if your desires are personal, egoic, for your own enjoyment, the energy you give them is necessarily limited. It cannot be more than what you have. The question and then says, Yet often ordinary persons do attain what they desire. Maharaj says, after desiring it very much and for a long time, even then their achievements are limited. And what about unselfish desires? And I'm just going to take a pause here. Rupert Spira, who is a modern day non-dualistic seeker, or even spiritual teacher, I don't even think he's a seeker at this stage. He's a non-dualist in the same tradition as Maharaj. And he has a few talks about desires coming on behalf of the universe on the whole and desires that come from the separate, isolated, selfish perspective, which is going to be the ego, which is going to be coming from a place of lack. So 
that's just something to bear in mind and you can go and explore that further if you desire, if you desire. Fine. So the question says, and what about unselfish desires? Maharaj says, when you desire the common good, the whole world desires with you. Make humanity's desire your own and work for it. There you cannot fail. The questioner then says, humanity is God's work, not mine. I am concerned with myself. Have I not the right to see my legitimate desires fulfilled? They will hurt no one. My desires are legitimate. They are right desires. Why don't they come true? Desires are right or wrong according to circumstances. It depends on how you look at them. It is only for the individual that his distinction between right or wrong is valid. So the question that says, what are the guidelines for such distinction? How am I to know which of my desires are right and which are wrong? In your case, desires that lead to sorrow are wrong, and those which lead to happiness are right. But you must not forget others. Their sorrow and happiness also count. And again, this is coming into the idea of oneness, unity. We're all the same at a core fundamental level. So we always have to be aware of not harming another as a golden rule do unto your do unto others as you would do unto yourself or do not do unto others as you wouldn't want done to yourself etc so the questioner says results are in the future how can i know what they will be maharaj says use your mind remember observe you are no different you are not different from others most of their experiences are valid for you too think clearly and deeply Go into the entire structure of your desires and their ramifications. They are a most important part of your mental and emotional makeup and powerfully affect your actions. Remember, you cannot abandon what you do not know. To go beyond, to go beyond yourself, you must know yourself. So already Maharaj is kind of like going off. So obviously the question is a bit confusing. He says, what does it mean to know myself? By knowing myself, what exactly do I come to know? All that you are not. All that you are not. That's that idea of the enlightenment being the removal of false identifications, removal of false fulfillment coming from, you know, I am not my job, uh, I am not my salary, I am not my social status. So the questioner says, and not what I am? Maharaj says, what you are, you already are. By knowing what you are not, you are free of it and remain in your own natural state. It all happens quite spontaneously and effortlessly. And what do I discover? You discover that there is nothing to discover. You are what you are, and that is all. But ultimately, what am I? The ultimate, desire, the ultimate denial of all you are not. I don't understand. That's the questioner. Nor do I understand, Maharaj. So Maharaj's response is, it is your fixed idea that you must be something or other that blinds you. If you trust me, believe when I tell you that you are the pure awareness that illumines consciousness and its infinite content. Realize this and live accordingly. If you do not believe me, then go within inquiring, what am I? Or focus your mind on I am, which is pure and simple being. Okay, now remember, let's go back. If you need to refresh yourself on what I am actually means, we'll go to the first video that I recorded in the series where we ex basically explain that I am in this context is pure awareness it's that space between thoughts it's that peace that we get when we're not identifying with form when we're not latching onto thoughts when we're just existing so the questioner asks maharaj on what does my faith in you depend on your insight into other people's hearts if you cannot look into my heart look into your own i can do neither Purify yourself by a well-ordered and useful life. Watch over your thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. This will clear your vision. 
Must I renounce everything first and live a homeless life? You cannot renounce. You may leave your home and give trouble to your family, but attachments are in the mind and will not leave you until you know your mind in and out. First things first. Know yourself. All else comes with it. But you already told me that I am the supreme reality. Is it not self-knowledge? Of course you are the supreme reality. But what of it? Every grain of sand is God. To know it is important, but that is only the beginning. Well, you told me that I am the supreme reality. I believe you. What next is there for me to do? Maharaj then says, I told you already. Discover all you are not. Body, feelings, thoughts, ideas, time, space, being and not being, this or that. Nothing concrete or abstract you can point out to is you. A more verbal statement will not do. You may repeat a formula endlessly without any results whatsoever. You must watch yourself continuously, particularly your mind, moment by moment, missing nothing. The witnessing, this witnessing is essential for the separation of the self from the not self. This is a huge, huge response. We have to be constantly alert on the stories we are telling ourselves, on the feelings that are arising in our body, on the effect that they're producing on the mind. We need to constantly be reminding myself, these thoughts aren't true. These thoughts aren't necessarily pointing to a reality. There's an illusion that I'm now experiencing. You know, it takes time and it takes a lot of work. And that's what Maharaj is saying. It's so easy to read a million and a half spiritual guides and think you know the answers to a happy, enjoyable life because you've read all these guides, but unless you put it into practice, they're meaningless. So the questioner's response to this is, the witnessing, is it not my real nature? Maharaj says, for witnessing, there must be something else to witness. We are still in duality. What about witnessing the witness? Awareness of awareness? Maharaj says, putting words together will not take you far. Go within and discover what you are not. Nothing else matters. I hope that was somewhat useful to you. And uh, I will see you again in the next reading.